This is Business Edge on New Central. I'm Tolu Lakwe at Dilleru Balogun. Our headline story, low demand pushes crude oil prices. Now, the lifeline of many nations, particularly those whose economies depend on the black gold, could be on the road to recovery, with the recent sale of crude oil hovering above $50 per barrel. This is our focus today. We'll also touch base with a few stories we're keeping our eyes on with NC4 to watch before we finish the show. Welcome. This is Business Edge. Now, global demand for crude oil is considerably slow, and this has maintained sales at about $50 and above at the beginning of 2021. This stroke of good fortune may continue with the announcement of an increase in the stimulus package from the new administration of President Joe Biden of the United States of America. Now, although this round of U.S. stimulus will focus on people affected by the COVID-19 lockdown, it is expected to aid spending and, by extension, assist manufacturing. But this is not all cheery news. On the other side is the reality that the new U.S. president inaugurated on Wednesday was set to take immediate measures to curb the U.S. oil industry. This includes a plan to re-enter the, the Paris Climate Accord, cancelling a permit for the Keystone XL crude oil pipeline and pausing planned drilling in the Arctic. Brent crude settled at $56.08 a barrel, gaining 18 cents, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate climbed 26 cents, settling at $53.24 a barrel. Prices have, however, turned negative on post-settlement trade after data by industry group American Petroleum Institute showed U.S. crude oil stocks unexpectedly rose last week swelling by 2.6 million barrels to about 487.1 million barrels. U.S. Treasury Secretary nominee Janet Yellen has urged lawmakers to act big on pandemic relief spending, which boosted oil prices earlier. This month, Brent hit an 11-month high of $57.42, helped by Saudi Arabia pledging to make additional voluntary cuts and most OPEC plus members agreeing to keep output steady in February. The expected moves to push for carbon reduction if they restrict supply could also boost prices. Now joining me from Accra, Ghana is financial analyst Benjamin Ato Kwansa. Benjamin, welcome to the show again. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. All right, let's get straight to it. So earlier this month, crude oil hit $57.42 per barrel, and now it's at $56.08 a barrel. And of course, all of this seems to be riding on some of the hopes of a new U.S. stimulus package. So how long do you think that crude oil can stay above $50 a barrel with a bit of limited demand in play? Okay, um, the oil market is simply responding to the idea of higher um, inflation expectations. This is typical government reaction to um, boost economies that have been hit by recessions like the one that we have recently seen due to um, the devastating effect of the coronavirus on the world economy. The United States has seen its GDP drop by almost 5%. Um, unemployment is rising at an unprecedented rate and the US President Joe Biden is desperate to hit the ground running. He has promised a $900 billion stimulus package, just as you mentioned, and a $1.4 trillion government and funding aimed at boosting the economy and speeding up vaccine distribution across the country. This relief package is expected to last until mid-March. Um, from where I sit, I see that the sustainability of the current prices of crude beyond then will hinge mainly on two things. Whether the U.S. Congress is able to act and roll out additional relief packages beyond mid-March and how effective the newly developed uh, coronavirus vaccines are. Okay, so let's get into some of the issues with OPEC. Now, according to OPEC's post-meeting press releases, OPEC Plus has agreed to lift oil production by 75,000 barrels per day over January levels. Saudi Arabia's announcement after the meeting also sent oil prices soaring, and that announcement was that the country would voluntarily cut an additional 1 million barrels per day in February and March above its current quota. All of this while OPEC's allies get to ramp up their own production. The OPEC Plus agreed not only for the February, but also for March as well. Now, March's production level will see an additional increase of 120,000 barrels per day over February levels, or about 195,000 barrels per day over January levels. 
With March's production quotas already set, the February meeting, therefore, will set production quotas for April. Do you think that Russia and Saudi Arabia particularly will be committed to the agreement reached at the OPEC Plus meeting? The, the price war that ensued between Russia and Saudi Arabia last year was mainly driven by um, detrimental effects of such low prices at that time on U.S. shale, which Russia sought to exploit. There was no way U.S. shale was going to survive price of around $30 per barrel if those prices had been sustained. What I mean is that Russia and Saudi Arabia couldn't reach an agreement because one of the parties had an agenda. No such situation exists right now, at least mm. to my knowledge. Mm. Um, when both parties realized they didn't want to find out how long they could survive such low price of crude oil, they came back to the table and struck a deal. I think historically, even though these countries belong to a group, they sometimes act in their own interests mm -hmm. when the conditions seem right for them. All right, so let's take a bit on Saudi Arabia. So the country has volunteered to cut 1 million additional barrels uh, per day for February and March. What's behind this voluntary move that is going to be good for everyone else? What it looks like, obviously, but in some way may affect them. So why is Saudi Arabia volunteering to do this? Well, um, Saudi Arabia is the biggest um, producer of oil in the world. So 1 million barrels of, of oil per day, even though it's going to benefit everyone else, it's also going to benefit them as well. Um, $1 million is not going to be very significant, looking at the number of barrels that they produce um, every day. So um, in order to, I mean, keep the prices at the levels that they are right now, it is in their interest that they, they do such voluntary acts like this in order to um, keep the prices sustainable. Okay. So let's also talk about the new agreement in terms of how it might affect African producers. This agreement now is meant to last February, March, thereabouts. How can African crude oil producers benefit from this and also help ease the deficits that many of these countries are going through because of COVID-19? Well, Africa could benefit or couldn't. Um, I think the effect goes both ways. A lot of other factors, apart from the agreement from the OPEC Plus, come to play in determining if um, rises in oil production be beneficial or not. For instance, the tone on fossil fuels by Joe Biden has been harsh. If he goes through with um, the, reduction in, the reduction in production as drastically as he's promised, then world prices could um, start rising. The NNPC in Nigeria is also clearly happy to abide by this agreement to raise oil production. They have bemoaned, I mean, the loss in revenue due to the agreements in, uh, the agreements to cut production in in yeah, these times, even though these, even though this tactic didn't um, raise oil prices by as much as the members in the OPEC plus had hoped, it mm. definitely played a part in propping it up to avoid even more severe falls um, in oil price. In Ghana, a new wave of the pandemic has has begun, the coronavirus pandemic, with some of the more deadly um, new variants of the virus being detected in infected people. The government is threatening to go into lockdown once again if the safety protocols are not followed and cases keep on rising. If the situation in Ghana is more widespread the world over, and in fact in Africa, and we enter into situations like we did in the early stages of combating the virus, African countries will be big losers with oil rigs firing at full or close to full capacity, yeah. but producing products that are making losses due to price falls resulting from falls in demand. I think this is a more likely scenario. Mm. All right. So we have the U.S. shale oil, which has been big on the market, but has um, it, it's still finding its footing in some ways, one might say. But as you said, looking at uh, the body language, as we might say, and the statements from U.S. President uh, Joe Biden in terms of the U.S. oil industry and looking at the environmental issues, what effects? What, what do you expect from him and how do you think his actions and policies will have a knockdown effect on African um, oil producers? I think that, um, just like I mentioned earlier, his stance on, on fossil fuels and um, building up that industry hasn't been really encouraging for players in the industry. Mm. Um, however, we have seen politicians say one thing whenever they want to get into power and then get into power and then do something else. Um, so if indeed he goes through with the things that he has said he's going to do, um, cutting down on production and then and then increasing or um, looking or investing more into um, alternative energy solutions, then of course it's going to benefit Africa because production is going to reduce, supply is going to fall, and then prices are going to shoot up. All right, Benjamin, we're going to take a quick uh, quick break here. When we come back, this conversation will continue. You are of course watching Business Edge on New Central. Do stay with me. Okay.
You are watching Business Edge on New Central. My guest is financial analyst Benjamin Ato Kwanza, who's joining us from Ghana. Now, Benjamin, um, some analysts say they believe that demand is lower and supply is the reason why the price is above $50 a barrel. What's your take on this? Well, I think that demand has um, risen from um, the levels that we've seen from around mid last year. Um, this increase this has caused an increase in oil price. Personally, I feel that the increase in demand is what has caused the increase in oil prices. Some countries are facing worse conditions from the coronavirus now than they did when uh, we got to know about it late 2019. However, an even larger number of countries have returned to almost pre-COVID levels of economic um, activity. This is not because the virus has disappeared in those areas, of course. People have sadly just grown tired of being scared, even though people still die every day from the virus. I think if governments all over the world are firm on getting the coronavirus really under control, the levels of economic activity will drop sharply. And that is when supply will actually um, play, a, play, a, play a part in um, determining the prices or causing the prices to rise as much as it is right now. Okay. So now we also know that one of the triggers of this surge seems to be the stimulus package in the United States. So for people who are thinking, What's happening in the U.S. and how much is playing out on the international crude oil market? Let's explain that. How does this stimulus package, how does it tie in, into higher international crude oil prices? Um, this, this, I think, is uh, based on the, the idea that um, increased levels of inflation is going to cause an increase in economic activity. Increased levels of economic activity is going to cause an increase in, um, in demand for crude oil. But personally, I believe that the most feasible plan is to get the coronavirus under control. Uh, this means that providing more funding into research into the virus and how it can be subdued. This also means making sure the vaccines that have been developed work and are effective with little or no side effect. The stimulus package is good for the economy. It's good for boosting the economy, especially looking at the levels of recession that have been um, seen all over, the, all over the world, in particular in America. Um, but in the short to medium term, I think it is likely uh, I think it is not likely to sustain the demand for oil and petroleum products. Okay, that's in the long term as it is. So let's talk a bit more about the long term. We're seeing the prices come back up. Countries like Nigeria have put forth their budgets and we're seeing where they're pegging crude oil prices. It's still early. Yes, we know it's early and we know that OPEC Plus has made this arrangement. But what are you thinking in terms of how crude oil prices will play out across this year um, into December, into some of the more traditional travel seasons that help boost some of this stuff? We don't have that again. We're having a situation with airlines also not enough passengers. People are not moving around as they usually would. You see a summer season in the U.S. where prices can drop depending on the supply or even um, increase because of supply as well. So in terms of what we're seeing because of COVID-19, what are your expectations for the year? Um, I think that even even though the coronavirus is still with us, um, the the reaction of the public to this virus now is very different from when it, from how it was when the virus first um, emerged on emerged. In, I mean, in China. Mm. So personally, I don't think that um, it's going to be too negative. Um, people are traveling a lot. People are traveling to even the UK. Um, just a few a few weeks ago, I had a colleague um, come to Ghana from the UK where coronavirus um, cases are still surging. Um, people are not attaching the level of seriousness that it did to this virus as they did when, I mean, it first emerged. And so I feel that right now it is on a, on a rising trajectory and it's going to keep on that way and even shoot even further up when the vaccines are seen to be more effective than mm. um, we have seen currently. Do you see a possibility of African nations getting some kind of opportunity uh, when it comes to increasing output to raise more revenue? When you have someone like Saudi Arabia saying, you know what, I'm volunteering to cut one million. Uh, other people are looking to maintain their levels. And then some of us, like here in Nigeria, might even ask uh, to increase our output so that we can make more revenue. What do you think? Could this happen? We have seen it before, but could it play out given the current circumstances that we have on ground? Definitely. We have um, um, a number of countries that are big players in the oil industry, Nigeria, Angola, a lot of other countries, Libya, etc., are all big players in the oil industry. And they could easily have a very uh, loud voice in, 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 in determining the supply and then the prices of um, oil, oil and then oil products. As I've alluded to earlier, um, any increase in oil production without a corresponding increase in the demand for the crude oil can be very easily have detrimental effects on 
uh, the revenue African countries expect from their oil resources. The only time I foresee African countries, again, getting this opportunity is when the coronavirus pandemic is properly managed, where we are in a situation where we are able to properly manage the um, coronavirus and where economic activity can be increased with sound government policies without fear of increasing infection rates of the virus among the populace. I mean, even on a side note, Mr. Dangote's refinery is coming up with a capacity to process about 650,000 barrels of crude per day. This is great for Nigeria and great for oil producing countries like my country, Ghana, located very close to Nigeria. Very soon, Africa will have a, a really loud voice in controlling the output to optimize revenues that they can make. I, I like that point you made, and that's where my final question is going to come from. Africa having much more of a voice uh, in controlling the output. So we've seen um, OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and then we've seen OPEC Plus, as it may be. And again, uh, Africa seems to sit at the table, but we take the decisions that are made and handed to us. We're not very, um, our voices are not very much heard when it comes to negotiating and being able to push things, even though we can get some concessions. What do you see the future of OPEC Plus and OPEC being as it relates to Africa? African countries and them having an opportunity to become more of decision makers at that table or at these tables now that we have two of them. Yeah, okay. Um, I think individually, um, African countries, um, in as much as we have a very loud voice, do not have as loud a voice as countries like Saudi Arabia, Russia, etc. do have. I think what is important um, for African countries in scenarios like we have right now is for us to come together unionize and have a have a single voice so that if Nigeria, um, Angola, Libya, Ghana, and then all the other African countries have a single voice, not having divergent opinions on um, what we think that production should be, what supply should be, then we are going to be listened to more. Mm. So I think it is up to African countries to come together and then um, have a single voice, have a unionized voice that will make us more louder. And then that'll make us, that'll make um, other players uh, or, or people out there, or, or countries at this table to listen to us even more. All right, Benjamin Ato Kwanza, financial analyst joining me from Accra, Ghana. Thank you so much for being with us on Business Edge. Thank you very much for having me once again. All right, we'll see you soon. Okay, we are going to wrap up the same way we do almost every day. And that's, to, of course, give you a few stories we're keeping our eyes on. And we start NC4 to watch in South Africa, where the country's inflation fell to the lowest in 16 years on a sharp decline in consumer demand. This is thwarting any hopes that the SA Reserve Bank might review its monetary policy stance. Data from Statistics SA shows that the country's annual inflation rate slowed to 3.1% in December from 3.2% in November, edging even firmer to the lower band of the Reserve Bank's largest range of 3 to 6%. This was the lowest inflation rate since September amid a slowdown in cost of housing and utilities and a decrease in prices of transport, restaurants and hotels. Morocco Minister, Morocco's Minister of Mines and Trade, Aziz Raba, has announced that the country is to establish a new lab to ensure quality of hydrocarbons in the market. Responding to a question regarding hydrocarbon quality during a hearing session at the House of Representatives, the minister said the project will require a budget of 10 million Moroccan dinar. Nigeria's repeated backtrack to its ways and means facility with the Central Bank of Nigeria highlights weaknesses in public financial management, according to Fitch Ratings. Fitch Ratings stated this in its report titled, Nigeria's deficit monetization may raise microstability risk. The WNM facility is the government's pre-existing overdraft at the CBN and was estimated at 9.8 trillion naira as of the end of 2019. And finally, Kenya's domestic debt has increased to 3.49 trillion Kenyan shillings in the first week of January 2021. This is a 19% jump from 2.94 trillion Kenyan shillings in the same period in 2020. Investors piled their funds in long-term government debt with treasury bonds increasing to 2.56 Kenyan shillings, 2.56 trillion Kenyan shillings from 1.97 trillion a year ago. In contrast, Treasury bills dropped to 835.76 billion Kenyan shillings from 878.94 billion Kenyan shillings at the start of 2020.
And that's it on this edition of Business Edge. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can also head to our website, www.newcentral.africa, and also download our mobile app on Play Store and Apple App Store. Until next time, I'm Tony Lopez. Adelaru Balogun. <laughs>